Big tech bounces back and not a moment too soon. Motley Fool Money starts now. I'm Chris Hill, joined by Motley Fool senior analyst Bill Mann. Thanks for being here. Hey, Chris, how are you? I, you know, there's green in the market, so I'm doing better than I was yesterday. Also, still nice to see you in the studio. Yes, yes. This is happening, isn't it? It is actually happening. Um, let's start with Microsoft um, because Microsoft's fourth quarter revenue came in just shy of fifty-two billion dollars. Uh, not as high as Wall Street wanted. It was the slowest revenue growth in two years. However, the cloud growth for Microsoft looked pretty strong. Their guidance was upbeat. Uh, they basically reiterated the guidance they put out three months ago for the new fiscal year. So, guidance trumps results, right? What well, kind of? I think some of this has to do with the fact, and we're going to talk about another company that that, that this fits also, that. Microsoft's the news that they that they came out with, even though they, they they missed, and you know we don't we don't care that much about about analyst estimates whether they 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 hit or miss, but it does in fact in, in impact the stock. You know, twenty twenty one turns out to have been really really hard comps for you know for for a lot of companies, uh, particularly because people were still people were still inside. We were all pretty nervous, and we. We, we we solved that by shopping. So, Microsoft's results not only were they were were they great, they were bonkers in certain ways. You know, five years ago, Microsoft's total revenues were ninety seven billion dollars for the for the entire fiscal year. Yeah. Now for the quarter, if you take the quarter for just for cloud and put it on a run rate, which basically means you take the number multiplied by four, it's a hundred billion dollars. They're making more in cloud than they made in everything five years ago. And once again, we're talking about Microsoft, which five years ago was 12 years removed from antitrust, you know, like antitrust uh, uh, lawsuits in the US and Europe. This, this company is absolutely positively. Massive, and maybe that's not a great insight, but it is growing rather quickly in areas that really didn't exist as revenue streams for it even a couple of years ago. So, when the larger conversation around the economy, the potential for a recession, inflation, all of those things continues to take place, do you take what should we take from Microsoft? Maintaining their guidance of three months ago for the for their they're looking out over the next twelve months and saying yes everything we believed three months ago factor in inflation rate hikes increased talk of recession we're still in of the same mindset in terms of what we see for this business what should we take from that I think it's important for companies uh, you know in terms of operators to recognize that this may have been the hardest operating environment that companies have ever operated in certainly certainly in the last 50 years given the fact that it seemed like the economy around the world was coming to a grinding halt in 2020 and so for better or for worse you know our central banks around the world responded to that uh, which meant that they responded by making sure that you know that that growth came as quickly as possible. We were worried about deflation. Now we're worried about inflation. In inflation is here. I think with a lot of companies, uh, particularly ones that are huge like 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 Microsoft, you have to keep in mind when you see a company that's operating in the way that they have the environment that we're operating in is absolutely unprecedented. Let's move on to Alphabet. On last Friday's show, Jason Moser and Matt Argusinger and I were talking about the mindset going into this earnings season. And I'm paraphrasing what Matty said, but he basically said, that, 
I feel like the the mindset from the message from Wall Street is just don't disappoint us too much. That's right. You can disappoint <laughs> us a little, but just don't. It's disappoint, okay. That's just right. Don't disappoint us too much. And I feel like that's what Alphabet has done with second quarter profits and revenue coming in lower than expected. And it's really across the board. It's 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 their mainstay business. It's YouTube. It's there, uh, but. Shares up four or five percent because essentially this is Alphabet saying, "Hey, we're not Snap." Yeah, that's, we're not, that's, that's right that, again. That's yeah, that exactly. Last week with Snap, we're not them. That's on them, pal. That's on them. That's that that that's not on us. It, there's something really really important to keep in mind when you're talking about Google and you're talking about their results. So obviously, sixteen it was sixteen percent growth in constant currency. But I don't know if you've heard about this. Chris, but the U.S. dollar is up against almost every currency in the world a lot. So, on a you know, if, if you take that currency factor out of the equation, they really, really did you know they really, really did well. And importantly, their revenues for at for advertising, which is the area that that blew Snap out of the water because their their revenues went down so much. Beat expectations at fifty six billion dollars. Fix it fifty six point three versus fifty six point one. Which you know you do that math backwards. That means they beat by two hundred million dollars. So this is a great business, and it is a and it is showing that in a very difficult environment. And the companies that compete with it that are lower quality are suffering in a way that that Google or Alphabet is not. When Alphabet CEO uh, Sundar Pichai talks about, um, as he did on the call, about um, this is a time where they are going to be focusing more, um, they are going to be looking more intensely at all of their business units. Do you read anything into that with respect to the parts of Alphabet's business that don't really make much money? If you're part of the other bets division, are you nervous when you hear that? Or do you think, no, this is just a little bit of extra focus and a little bit of extra color from the CEO? No, I think one one of the things that's really important is that is that Alphabet came out a couple of weeks ago and said that they were pulling back on employee uh, on, on hiring, basically. And their employee headcount quarter over quarter going through the second quarter of 2022 was 10,000 additional employees. And if you, if you do the math backwards a little bit, you, you know, there's about $300,000 in expenses per new employee per year. So if you just, if you just ratchet that back, and this is not an entirely fair way to think about it. This is not a bad way to think about it. That's about six billion dollars in additional free cash flow that may fall to the bottom line. So, Alphabet hasn't said that they're cutting anywhere. They're simply they're they're simply removing some of the bets that weren't that that weren't working uh, working out. They're simply ramping back a little bit in terms of hiring. So I wouldn't be nervous at all if I was anywhere within that big weighted blanket that is that is Alphabet. Chipotle's second quarter revenue was a little lower than expected, but their profits were strong because, amazingly. Chipotle continues to raise prices, and it continues to work. And I, 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 when I saw this, I thought back to earlier this year when they were talking about how they had been raising, raising prices up to that point. Brian Nickel, the CEO, saying, "Yep, we're going to continue to do this." And I think I may have said on this show, "This is going to be interesting to watch because I'm not sure how much higher they can go." And clearly, they can go higher and. It's working. The stock is up 15%, Bill. Yeah. There was an amazing number, an amazing number in this report. And it is this Chipotle's food cost as a percentage of sales dropped despite inflation, which just shows how much power they have had to go to their board and raise prices. And they've stuck. Now, at some point, they're going to come up on a natural limit. But the fact is, they weren't raising prices at least 100% as a response to inflation. They were, they were raising prices because they felt like they had capacity to go to the board and, and, you know, and, and increase that way. I, I'm going to make the mistake of comparing Chipotle 
which is a business that makes burritos, to Apple, <laughs> which is a business that makes iPhones. One of which, which is one of which has a name like a food. So yeah, okay, so it but, fits. But in the earlier days, you go back a decade, people would ask, and it was a reasonable question at the time, can Apple continue to do this? Can they continue to keep... Because the law of pricing when it came to consumer technology for the longest time was prices come down over time. Flat screen TVs, which used to cost $1,000, now cost just a couple hundred dollars. How much longer can Chipotle keep this up? Because if you'd asked me earlier this year, are they going to be able to do this in the summer? I would have bet no, and I would have been wrong. Our friend from Technomic, uh, David Henkes, made a really interesting point um, uh, about Chipotle's earnings, and it was observational versus anything else. And it was that it w- was that. Uh, Chipotle is on a list of other businesses that are struggling with their in-store experience because of the lack of the lack of labor availability. And so I think if there is a risk for Chipotle like being able to keep doing it, it's because they are and maybe it's not their fault because they, you know, because labor has been really really tight that they do have some labor costs that I think are latent at this point that fully staffed stores would in fact increase that cost in a way that's not being measured now. Great point, Bill Mann. Always great talking to you. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Chris. One investment scam is on the rise and we'll help you avoid it right after a word from our friends at Bigger Pockets. Real estate investing is one of the best ways to build long-term wealth. But to be a successful investor, you need to know what news and trends to pay attention to and what's just noise. I'm Dave Meyer, real estate investor and VP of analytics at Bigger Pockets. And in my new show, On the Market, a Bigger Pockets podcast presented by Fundrise, we bring you expert perspectives in a digestible format so you can make informed investing decisions. And we make it fun. I promise you, On The Market is definitely not another boring news show. Each week, I chat with a panel of experts about the latest news and trends affecting the real estate investing world. We touch on things like government policy, 3D printed houses, investing in the metaverse, and more. So join us every Monday for On The Market, the podcast designed to help you invest with confidence. Just search On The Market in your favorite podcast app. That's On The Market. The cryptocurrency market may be crashing, but we are trending toward a record year for crypto scams. Ricky Mulvey caught up with Jack Caparol to talk about The Motley Fool's latest research on investment fraud and how you can avoid these scams. Twenty twenty two will be a record year for investment fraud, and a lot of that money is going to come from cryptocurrencies. Joining us to talk about investment fraud and the Motley Fool's research on crypto scams is Jack Caporal, analyst for the Ascent. Thanks for being here, Jack. Oh, thanks for having me. So, uh, what what did you learn? What did you guys research on crypto and investment scams? What did you find out? Yeah, so we uh, used a combination of data from the FTC and uh, survey data that that we collected. And like you said, we found out that 2022 is going to be record year for losses, both uh, in terms of investment scams and then crypto scams in particular, most of which are a subset of investment scams, right? And the numbers are pretty mind boggling, especially in relation to the past five years. So, in the first quarter of 2022 alone, we're looking at a total of 672 million dollars in losses from investment scams 2017 for the entire year uh, there were 50 million dollars lost in investment scams right and in the first quarter of 2022 alone uh, losses have already totaled more than a third of the total losses in 2021 right so in a quarter you've done a third of all of the losses last year uh, a quarter's do it a third that's way too much math for my head jack Basically, we're on track to potentially be like 50%, have 50% more losses from investment scams overall this year compared to last year. And so gotcha. we're probably looking at a range of, of maybe $2 billion in losses reported. Uh, and that's definitely an undercount, right? Our survey shows that not everybody reports losses. And then in terms of crypto fraud alone, you know, 2021. 
there's about $680 million lost, reported lost as a result of crypto fraud. We're going to smash through that this year. In the first quarter of 2022, there have been $329 million reported lost, right? So nearly half in a quarter. I want to clarify something. You said 2018, there's about $12 million lost in investment fraud. That was cryptocurrency fraud in 2018, where $12 million was lost. That's where, like, investment fraud has been around for a very long time. We're just now seeing a new flavor of it. What are these cryptocurrency scams looking like? Yeah, so crypto scams, they really are just a new type of wrinkle in old scams, right? So instead of being contacted by phone or online text message about some great investment opportunity or an investment manager that can take your money and guarantee you 25% return in six months, uh, they're just saying we can do that, but with crypto. Um, so we're like a crypto fund manager, um, or you'll see it as a play on a romance scam where, you know, you'll be kind of tricked into a online relationship and your alleged partner will say, Hey, I've got a great investment opportunity. It's in crypto. This is how you can send me some crypto. You know, obviously the victim never gets that money back. So we're seeing, uh, scams of old use crypto um, as an an investment opportunity um, and also as a method of of payment or transaction it's just it's like a little cayenne pepper into an old recipe where you got essentially the the classic romance scam which is someone essentially like what catfishing is someone else then saying hey i need money for xyz or hey here's a cool which by the way i am shocked that these romance scam partners are not just shutting down the conversation once they start hearing about crypto that doesn't seem like a like a good lead in if you were trying to meet people online yeah i mean the way that i think about the romance scam thing in particular and also the investment scams where you know, in my experience, I'll get like a WhatsApp from a random number and I'll be like, hey, I'm a Bitcoin fund manager, like click on this link and you can send, like I'll set you up with these crazy returns. The way I think about it is there are very few people in my life that I would be comfortable sending a significant amount of money to, to manage, right? And if I don't know you in person and haven't known you for a very long time and trust you, there's like a 0% chance I'm going to send you any money, any crypto, whatever. So it's a it's a huge red flag if you get that type of message, and and you should really think twice uh, before you send money or crypto to someone to some number who you've never met in person, right? Who you just know online. One interesting part of your your research is you looked specifically at how much money people are losing on all these types of scams. Um, I thought it was interesting that the investment fraudsters are netting an average of five hundred and seventy five bucks per scam. Meanwhile, the government imposters, I assume those are the the folks calling me with with information about my my social security benefit, are only netting forty dollars. What are the investment fraudsters doing right? It seems like that's that's a very little amount of money to to get from a scam. I think there are probably two things going on there. First is it's more attractive to send money or crypto to someone who says, we can double that versus you owe, you owe me money. You're going to drag your feet on the person who says, you know, you owe me X amount of money uh, or you need to pay this amount to get your social security unlocked or whatever. But the reward is enticing, right? The investment opportunity is enticing. And then second, you know, this is another just like gut feeling. There are like pretty hefty uh, legal ramifications for impersonating government officials, and I think that type of risk probably makes that type of scam less attractive. Right? It's a much riskier proposition to impersonate a government official than it is to say, you know, I'm an I'm an alleged investment fund manager. What what's social media's role in the, in the rise of these crypto scams? It does seem like I'm seeing a lot of those account takeovers on on someone's Instagram where surprise now they're shilling a crypto but actually it's a hacker who got into their account and now it's a, it, they're running a scam. Yeah. So the data on this is pretty wild. In 2018, 11% of scams that use crypto as a payment method started on social media. More recently, that number has jumped up to nearly 50%, right? So, scammers uh, and operating in the crypto space are leaning heavily on social media, and it's working. And I think it's working for a couple of reasons. First is there's 
an insane amount of inf personal information that people put on social media that scammers can use to kind of personalize scams or target certain individuals that they think are more likely to fall for the scam. Right, so it's way easier to gather information on potential targets over social media. And then second, I think there's so much FOMO originates from social media, right? You see folks who have allegedly made big gains on crypto over the past few years. And, you know, social media, you're just one or two DMs away from trying to get in on that game. Um, so it makes sense that see these big success stories, uh, you're already on social media someone reaches out to you through social media, it's kind of all in the same space, right? Well, and and to your point about the success stories, that was the story for maybe the past couple of years. Right now, it's the crypto market is, is, is down precipitously, and, and yet, it, uh, according to your research, the scams are still going to skyrocket. What do you think? Uh, what do you think gives there, where you have this very down market? You would think there's less interest in crypto, and yet scams are, are going to skyrocket this year. Yeah, I think it's I think it's two things. I think there's still quite a bit of that FOMO that I was talking about, right? 2020, the latter half, and 2021 were pretty insane, unprecedented runs, especially for the crypto market. And I think you know people still want to get in on that. If you're like a, a real believer in in crypto, the thought is that you know it's going to go back up eventually, and this is just a period. Or yeah, there's a downturn, but you know the true believers still think that it's going to go to the moon and all that. And then second, I don't know how much the average scam victim is taking into consideration kind of the longer term downturn trend, right? I think if someone approaches you and they say, "Send us some crypto, we can manage it, get you 25 percent in in two months," that sounds pretty good, even if. It might even sound better, given that the crypto market's in a downturn, right? Um, so I, I, the idea of just making a quick buck is is so attractive, and you know history shows that it it could be possible. Um, so why not give it a shot, right? One of the things you you found is that the average age or the most likely age to get caught by a crypto scam was thirty to thirty nine. I thought that was particularly interesting. Um, that it's millennials, especially getting hit with this, people who you would think are more internet savvy. So, for, for for someone listening right now, you might think you're too good to get scammed, but it's always good to know the common signs. Uh, what are, what are some of the common signs you would say of a crypto scam getting thrown at you? Yeah, I mean, for any scam uh, that's investment related, if the opportunity seems too good to be true, it's usually a scam, right? No one can guarantee you outrageous returns over an extremely short period of time. Uh, it's just not going to happen. Do your own research. You know, at the fool, we say don't invest in something if you don't understand it or haven't heard of it. And if you're approached by someone who's who's hawking a token that's new to you, just throw that token in Google with scam or review or complaint next to it. And if it is a scam, it'll be uh, very clear. And then if you're approached about uh, investment opportunity that requires you to pay by crypto. Um, by wire transfer or by gift card, that's definitely a scam. Those three methods of payment, once you've sent the money, it is extremely difficult, if not impossible, to get it back. That's the reason why those are the most uh, common forms of transactions in, in scams. Uh, full disclosure, I own a little bit of Solana, own a little bit of Ethereum. Has, has your research on crypto scams affected the way you invest, and, and do you invest in any cryptocurrencies personally? So I don't own any crypto. I wouldn't say that my research my research hasn't affected my thought process behind investing in crypto. It's doesn't fit my risk profile uh, and I'd like to see more regulation in the space on par with how traditional equities are regulated. The research for me is just crystallized that this is a space where more education is needed. I think 47% of the folks that we surveyed said that financial institutions and the government have done a poor or very poor job educating them about investment and crypto scams. Uh, and it's unfortunate because the amount of money that's being lost by just average Americans of all ages is really mind-boggling. 
But not everybody in separate research, you guys found that 62% of high net worth crypto owners say they're actually more interested in investing in cryptocurrency because of high profile scams. That was something you did back in November, and uh, that's a conversation for another time. Hey, Jack Capital, he's an analyst for The Ascent for The Motley Fool. Appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. As always, people on the program may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against, so don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear. I'm Chris Hill. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.